first. Um, I got some new shoes. I got some new shoes. It's been a while. Um, I've not, I don't think the last thing I bought was maybe the Sakai LDV waffles, which I haven't worn yet because my feet are too fat. But um, I bought some new shoes lately. Um, I've been trying to get back into the whole shoe thing. I think, um, what did I hear? I listened to this podcast, right? Let me quickly tell you why I want to go back into listening to sh- into watch wearing shoes. It's probably a weird point, but hope you guys kind of get where I'm coming from. Let's see if I can make this make sense. So as you guys are aware, I've been a sneakerhead or I've been someone that's been interested in trainers for a long time. You know, most of my um, adult life, I kind of got introduced to it via Crooked Tongues. That was my kind of first introduction. That forum was kind of the birthplace for my uh, passion for sneakers. Um, interested in it. You know, I did the whole thing about collecting shoes. I had over 150 shoes at one time. Um, at that, especially during that era when I was collecting shoes, that was the era when Nike SB really started to come into its own. So we got, you know, the Tiffany Dunks, the What the Dunks, and all these other things came out during that era. Loads of cool Air Force Ones. Clot Air Force Ones are still a big thing at the time. Obviously, Hiroshi is still, you know, somebody I look up to. Aaron Bondaroff with the New York thing and other, other projects he did. Going to the Hideout and buying Supreme. Uh, double taps and all that stuff and then obviously the nowhere uh, the busy workshop in london as well that was a big deal um q culture was massive i met loads of friends that who have kind of really dear to me now even to this point so it was a really seminal moment in my life it kind of introduced me to this whole entire world it kind of opened its doors to me so i kind of came into it through sneakers then started skateboarding then discovered streetwear so it's kind of a backwards way i think some people come in through it maybe through skateboarding then they find all the clothing and shoes or some people come into it uh, through streetwear and then go that way but i started from yeah i started from sneakers and then kind of worked my way up but luckily i didn't end up being like a nike talk guy you know the kind of dudes that don't look like they can dress at all that's that's that was not the era where you just kind of wear expensive clothes and wear dead dead you wear expensive trains but dead clothes luckily i was able to kind of progress through it but maybe i think the skating helped because skaters by the most part for the most part you know have quite a cool sense of style so I was able to kind of circumvent that, and obviously, uh, in addition to that too, when I was when I was in school, because I was in a went to yeah a school in the ends in it for the most part, but it was quite mixed, and I was um, lucky that I was always in the higher sets, which which allowed me to kind of speak to a different group of people. And then when I went to play football, or I went out, or we went out raving and stuff, it was with a different group of people too. So I had that kind of mesh, that merge, which kind of I think in, in really influenced my my style of rule. So I was able to kind of. Uh, I was able to kind of uh, dodge the kind of Nike Talk style bullet, right? Where you wear, you know, remember Nike Talk, uh, what you're wearing, Fred, was always horrendous. And guys, you know, it's just these adult men wearing matching T-shirts, new eras and trainers and stuff. It was a bit cringe. I was able to kind of, you know, flatten that a bit. But anyway, um, with shoes, so I went through um, a weird era with shoes. I think I got a bit, I got a bit um, disillusioned with trainers and that whole culture, maybe partly due to the way it ended for me when I used to work at a store called 1948. It was like one of the, you know, seminal sort of underground little sneaker spots. Well, underground, not really underground, but, you know, one of the main spots to go to to buy kind of limited edition Nike shoes. It launched in conjunction with the Beijing Olympics and they launched it in um, in Shoreditch. I'm sure you guys who are listening will know where it is. And I was kind of one of the official, one of the original members of that crew, kind of got brought into it luckily via um, A-Side, who's, who's now doing a no good vacancy and stuff. So I owe him a lot for that intro, kind of effectively gave me that job on a plate. And that kind of served as a platform, you know, for us to be connected with the culture, connected with you know, all the stuff going on. Boiler Room was kicking up at that time, warehouse parties, um, you know, just generally being about town. I think that was partly the reason why I ended up being doing a night at the Alibi too, because I got introduced to one of the marketing guys who knew the guy who owned Alibi. So it was all kind of, that platform was a real good uh, spot. But over time, of course, naturally with these kind of things, when you don't cultivate relationships and you're very, you know, you know, I don't know, I wasn't engaged in kind of making friends and clicking up. I got a bit put off by it immediately, maybe due to my kind of fractious relationship I had with some of the guys from Palace, right? I was, you know, a big fan of the brand before, you know, when it first died, I, I bought maybe the first two out of the five shirts they put out. Then I met the people behind it and, you know, it didn't go well in person. Um, which you know these things happen and you can meet people in real life and you know they can maybe not live up to expectations or you can just come across weird and they don't rate you you don't rate them so you know whatever and i just find it weird to kind of wear their stuff and i think that also coincided with the nike thing breaking down and i didn't really make the relationships that i needed so then when they moved into another direction they went to get new staff they didn't keep me because no one cared about me because i didn't make any friends you know this whole thing so that kind of made me a bit bitter i think in that regard which i'm not really that kind of guy if you know me in real life i'm not a bitter dude but i kind of Grew up as well, started getting into DJing too, started getting into electronic music, and I kind of just grew up in it. I kind of wanted to be a, a contributor to culture, not just a consumer, so I kind of did away with the whole purchasing of loads of shoes and kind of put my 
efforts into putting on nights, making zines, making t-shirts, you know, doing the whole um, creative hipster lifestyle. So that kind of put me off of it. But I think over time, I've seen that I've kind of steered back into it because I, I've listened to his podcast, right? Um, that that got recommended by uh, Benjamin Edgar from uh, The Brilliance. He recommended this great podcast with this guy and he basically spoke about the need to have, the need to, the need to maintain a sense of beauty or like passion or craft in your life. And I think I've always kind of had that gap long in my life when I kind of look, which is why I'm kind of drawn to people like maybe Tom Sachs and stuff, right? We have this practice in the studio where they essentially are able to make these dream projects, um, these kind of, pro these kind of, you know, self-absorbed projects that probably don't have any other purpose outside of the fact that he just wanted to make it. Um, this ability to make something with your hands as well, take something from, idea to actual ex to actual final product there isn't you know you don't really see um tom sachs so sharing you know psd files of line sheets of ideas he has there's always physical items that are made with his hands or made with machines and stuff and i always find that really cool and i guess that's something i've kind of missed in my life because especially with most of my stuff being on screen whether it's come kind of podcasting or djing and stuff so digital there's nothing really tangible it's quite hard to kind of have that so i think i'm kind of staring back into collecting shoes in a very purposeful meaningful way like stuff that i actually like and wear i'm always i'm the fan of wearing trainers and not really you know hiding them and put, putting them in perspective glasses so i'm back into this trainer thing merely just because i want to have beauty back in my life again and i think this podcast here spoke about it. let me see if i can find it yeah this is this podcast right um and it's a podcast by this guy called let me see if i can get up on the screen Ben so beg benjamin edgar for recommending it i'm gonna get up on your screen so it's this podcast here it's from a hey man podcast and it's, it's with this guest called, what's his name? Uh, David Coggins, right? I guess this week is David. So I'm going to read you quickly the, the synopsis of, this, of the podcast. Uh, there is an art to loving something, right? That's the kind of byline from it, which is quite what, going back into trainers. And it says, our guest this week is David Coggins. David is the editor of the new website, The Contender, and an author of the NY Times Best Bestseller, Men in Style and Men in Manners. His work on travel, style, and design has appeared in numerous publications. He's currently working on a new book about fly fishing. He lives in New York. David makes a compelling case for why dressing well is about the people around you instead of what, about yourself. And we spend a long time going into what it means to care about things and be obsessive and take things seriously. Our advice seeker this week needs some help with pleasure and how to truly enjoy oneself. Right? So it's a really cool idea and something I've kind of been contending with myself. Like this idea of having beauty and collecting things with purpose and Every st all the stuff that I used to collect back in the day, streetwear stuff from Umaraki was something that I was always passionate about, but I kind of lost it, you know, due to kind of getting involved with all the nonsense industry stuff and getting a bit jaded. But now I'm in the point where I kind of, I feel like I'm pre I'm contributing to culture enough through the DJing and stuff that I do. And then I want to add to it a little bit more by, you know, going back to making zines, writing on my blog more often. Um, I'm going to eventually set up another Instagram for all the kind of social, all the kind of nightlife um activities i kind of get up to interviewing artists showcasing new things just being a part of culture that's what i'm going to start doing more often and um i think one step towards it is to kind of you know buy things of intention and i thought you know why not go out there and you know sample some of the sneakers out there because i think as weird as the sneaker industry is at the moment especially with resale culture i also think with stuff like places like StockX and the fact that every brand is trying to essentially make their own yeezy right they're trying to create that viral moment where they sell out every single special release with that kind of first level in the industry sometimes because they're ramping up the special production the special editions they're also kind of ramping up the level overall of all the shoes right which is why nowadays it's hard to find a gr even stuff in jd sports right even though the quality might be shit it's hard to find a gr that's crap most of the average shoes that you might see in good hood or size and stuff are pretty decent right they're really good and then when you go up to the end all those kind of places you get all the special releases but for the most part across the board all shoes are improving because of this first level at the top to get all the sneaker guys to sell out the shoes that they're making so that's allowing everyone else to kind of get involved and also it's allowing brands to kind of reach out to brands that aren't so it's also allowing brands to reach out to sneaker companies who are maybe wouldn't have gave them a look maybe five or ten years ago and get collaborations because they want to be the ones to kind of be the first to you know co-sign this brand and have that kind of brand relationship and also kind of tap into the culture at heart. And there's no other better example than these 
no vacancy in uh, new balances that i've got right the 850s which got retro quite recently i saw a video of a few other guys on youtube re- um uh previewing the um, the og pair but i've got a pair of the no vacancy in um new balances i've got the gray pair i also tried to get the the navy pair but i didn't get them unfortunately from good hood so big up good hood too for delivering them i was a bit miffed about the process with good hood you have to kind of do the launches thing register your thing and obviously have a payment already in place and then once you get once you get them they take the payment out if you don't they refund you so that's all cool but they don't allow you to pick it up which is annoying yeah it has to be sent to you but luckily they send it with dpd so i got it literally the next day which is all right but i would have preferred an option to kind of collect them so if you know if anyone from Goodwood is listening and you have that option to maybe collect uh your shoes especially because you know i live in london i can get to Goodwood in, in basically half an hour it would have been nice to get them on a the day just for you know for geek out purposes but yeah i'm happy with the shoe it comes in this gray box no point showing the box just show the shoe straight away so i've got the gray pair as you can see here you get a pair of the red laces uh but i personally think the um, i personally think the white laces work better with the gray pair and the red laces look better with the navy pair but yeah the gray the gray pair is really nice loads of nice bits of suede on it mix of uh leather and then you've got this nice uh hard mesh here at the top at the front of the toe box as well I like the fact that on the side of the unit, which makes the, the new the A50 special of the New Balance, I think it's one of the only ones, or there's only maybe a three or four models that don't have the actual N on the side emblem. It's actually moved there to the to the back of the heel. I think it might be the first shoe that actually had this happen to. Oh yeah, I'm pretty sure I had. I'm pretty sure I've, I've watched a review where the guy said it. And then the only kind of the only thing that says um, no vacancy on it is actually on the tongue. I thought they'd have more on there, and they've also got it on the insole, but I had to take it out because you know my feet don't fit without the insole which is the annoying thing because i'm usually i'm a uk 10 but if i get out 10 and a half is too big so i have to get a 10 and then take out the insole that was that makes it kind of perfect so my feet are a bit lower to the ground and also i think the fact that it's so thick the sole i would much prefer my feet to be lower so i'm not walking on such a you know hill and not kind of fucking up my overall arch but yeah i love the shoe i think it's a really nice really cool colorway again it's very versatile i think in terms of the shape very first time of the colorway materials i've worn it with jeans and chinos and stuff and i'm sure if they last to the summer i'll be able to wear them with shorts but i'm looking forward to getting a navy pair hopefully next month um i'll be able to get a navy pair to, to complete them but again just a really nice collaboration something that you won't see going for crazy prices on StockX or whatever maybe but for me in terms of getting back into being a bit more of a collector and being a fan of things i think this is a good step forward again i'm, I'm buying trainers i actually like trainers i'm going to wear day in day out it's not your usual, you know, Yeezy 350 or Jordan 1. It's something a little bit different. Um, I've always been a big fan of New Balances. I've worn them, you know, for years. I had, like, you know, loads of mad hectic New Balance collabs back in the day, which you, if you're familiar with New Balance, you know how loud and nutty they look. So these are really up my alley, and I can't wait to get some wearing them. And again, probably similar to the Tom Sachs, I'm probably going to wear these a lot, you know, really get some wearing them, not really treat them, you know, super crazy or super, like, you know, tender and really kind of you know get back into the game but yeah this is the first step into that kind of direction again so uh big up new vacancy for making these i guess um cool collaboration not much more to be said about that um the clothing is pretty cool as well i think if you check that out as well i've seen the the tracksuits and stuff but um i think that's a bit cringe to wear that but for now the shoes will do for me um cool collaboration really cool process to order from goodhood and yeah by and large all good so i'm back in the sneaker game so if you're going to see a, little, a few more reviews on here, and I think I might do this thing next year too where I'll, I'll do like a series where I'm going to, because StockX got some great stuff on there. I might do like a £100 budget on StockX and just buy some stuff that isn't, you know, you don't really see a lot of people talking about because, you know, most of the, especially when you listen to someone like a little yay and stuff, right? It's quite it's a bit depressing, isn't it? Because essentially, you know, he lucked out because, you know, he became a successful rapper and he's insanely wealthy now. So he just went out and just bought all the hype shoes. He essentially bought everything. I think you mentioned it in his um interview with those guys from um full size run right he did it which is a really cool show i recommend you check it out from complex and he sat down and he essentially said you know he bought everything because he's got the money to do it which isn't really the way not really a sneakerhead way right um i would say being a sneakerhead is more about you know unearthing the epitome for me for a sneakerhead is when all those sneakerheads in amsterdam essentially made the asics like a trendy trainer right it wasn't something that people actually cared about but through those kind of Dutch guys, you know, maybe some of the people involved in Pattern Extended Crew, they were able to take the Asics and kind of the Asics gel light, whatever, and, and basically propel it up into being this kind of, you know, really desirable trainer. And I think that's what Sneaker is about. It's about kind of plucking out, again, not about the brand, it's more about plucking out models that people aren't really caring about and making it, uh, making it hot. So the fact that people are, you know, only wearing Jordan 1s and stuff is a bit boring. 
it's, I, I find it more interesting that you picked up a, a sale item, a sale pair of vans that no one cares about, and then you made them look amazing, and then they suddenly all sold out. Uh, that would be pretty cool. So I think I might do that going forward, like a little £100 challenge, $100 or £100 challenge for £100 or even better. Go on StockX, find a shoe that I think is cool from back in the day or something I just think is interesting and, you know, kind of bring it back and do a little review. But yeah, those are the new shoes I bought, man. Back in it, so it's interesting to see, isn't it? Interesting to 